Bom dia a todos. Muito obrigada pela presença de vocês na terceira edição da nossa Global Managers Conference, principal evento da área de distribuição de terceiros do BTG Pactual, onde nós reunimos os melhores gestores globais. O tema do nosso segundo dia de conferência será investimentos alternativos. Para este painel, nós convidamos o Chris Dorney, Managing Director da ITWAS, gestora americana que gere mais de 143 bilhões de dólares e oferece mais de 40 estratégias diversificadas entre renda variável, renda fixa e alternativos. Richard Brown, gestor de portfólio de ações europeias da Janus Henderson, gestora inglesa que possui hoje mais de 450 bilhões de dólares sob gestão e oferece estratégias inovadoras entre ações, renda fixa, multimercados e alternativas mundialmente. E o Steve Turner, analista sênior de pesquisa do Morgan Stanley, gestora americana com presença em 23 países, mais de 80 anos de história e que gere mais de 1,4 trilhões de dólares. Para moderar esse painel, nós convidamos o Borja Largo, Head Global de Fundos da Alfan. Muito obrigada e agora eu passo a palavra para o Borja. Great, thanks a lot, thanks Laura for the introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Sorry for not being able to do this uh, panel presentation uh, in Brazilian, but I just had to adapt, you know, to what the uh, uh, speakers, you know, could speak, which is a great English, by the way. So we will follow up in this uh, in this context. So. Uh, Uh, thank you for BTG Pactual for inviting us for the 2021 Global Managers Conference. My name is Borja Largo. I'm in charge of the relation with fund managers in All Funds Bank. And it's a big pleasure to moderate this session where we will be during the next hour trying to bring light on uh, what is going on on the alternative investments uh, market. For this, we have the big pleasure to have with us three outstanding companies and professionals to discuss about the past, the present and the future of the alternatives and the role that they can play in this environment. So even if Laura did a brief introduction of them, I will basically ask again to spend one minute introducing your company and yourself. So Chris, uh, Chris, Richard, Steve, starting with Chris, go ahead, thank you. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris Dahney. I'm a managing director at AQR Capital, where I'm a member of the research team within our global stock selection group. Um, AQR Capital, we manage about 140 billion US dollars um, and have been in operation for about 20 years. We take a systematic approach to fundamental investing, meaning we're, we're quants. We, we invest systematically model-based, but based on underlying fundamental economic drivers. And we do that across traditional investments in both equities and fixed income. So think of that as beat the benchmark type of, of strategies, as well as a broad range of liquid alternative uh, strategies, all applying similar types of models. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me today. My name is Richard Brown. I work for Janice Henderson and have done for the last 15 years. Um, we've got roughly 25 offices around the world and we're running approximately $10 billion in alternative assets. I actually work across our three USITS products that are focused on uh, global longshore equities. Hi everyone, it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to speak to you today. I, I work for Morgan Stanley Investment Management. Um, I manage fundamental research in our, in our portfolio solutions group where we customize um, and, and manage um, multi-asset portfolios, particularly specializing in, in alternative investments. So we manage around $18 billion today. Um, our group was formed in, in 2007. My particular focus is on private markets across private equity, uh, private credit and, and real assets and uh, I look forward to uh, participating today. Excellent. So thanks a lot for the intro. So I guess we will be able to discuss uh, strategies uh, in a broader base given your expertise. So uh, first, let's just start to have a bit of a review of what has been investing in the last months. Okay. So alternative strategies are typically included in a diversified portfolio to help to navigate difficult times by providing uh, uh, down markets and volatility protection. I think it is hard to imagine such a painful time that it has been for the people first and also for the markets as the one that we have lived since March 2020. Have alternatives performed to the expectations? Would you, uh, Richard, uh, please uh, take first this one? Yeah, sure. Um, and I guess the simple answer for me would be yes. I think alternatives have had a pretty good COVID pandemic in truth. And finally, you know, I think in truth, the, the asset class as a whole has tended to let its investors down a fair bit during these periods of stress. Looking back historically, 
Um, and I think the COVID pandemic has actually been a, a, a proof statement for a lot of managers that actually we, we, we can offer what clients need during these periods of stress. And that is, first and foremost, drawdown protection. So if I look at the average usage fund, for example, in the first quarter of uh, 2020, um, not just long short portfolios, but macro trend following portfolios as well, um, we saw a drawdown of roughly 4% on average from alternative funds through the first quarter of last year versus a drawdown in the MSCI World Index of roughly 21%. So from a drawdown perspective, I think actually the asset class as a whole can get a big tick. And then actually saw funds in on average capture more of the upside when things returned. But I think the biggest takeaway that I would have from it was actually the dispersion within the fund category. You know, again, looking at that first quarter last year, the best performing fund was up 30 percent. The worst performing fund was down 70 percent. What other asset class do you look at all the all the different funds you can have on offer and within one quarter? You've got a hundred percent difference within your return profile. So I think that just serves to highlight that there's lots of different flavors out there in alternatives. And actually, I think fund selection is probably most important in this asset class versus almost almost any other. Yeah, I would I would completely agree with that. I mean, I think um, to some degree it it challenges the the concept of alternatives as an asset class itself. As opposed to a categorization, it's it's almost um, you know it's almost like the junk drawer in the kitchen, right? I've got a drawer with utensils, I've got a drawer with pot holders, and then I got a drawer with everything else sort of thrown in it. Um, and, and that can be the case when we look at the performance, um, you know, in multi strategies over the last twelve to eighteen months, or even even twenty twenty, um, you know, in some of our uh, uh, the areas we look at closely, you could see, you know, if you were a value oriented market neutral equity manager, you were you were having a rough go of it in 2020 and 2019 and 2018 as, as well. Um, if you were event driven um, and, and you had a large allocation to say SPACs, you had a wonderful 2020. Um, and some of the global macro strategies were, were perhaps in between. So it depends a little bit, you know, which flavor of alternative, because it's it's hard to say, you know, alternatives are an asset class in the same way that equities are an asset class. They can be highly differentiated um, between themselves. So, so, you know, fully concur with Richard's point about you need to be specific about what you're looking at. And we will be more specific in the in the next questions. Okay, but I would like to finish this part of the uh, of the introduction asking Steve, uh, what have been assuming, I guess that's the case, and we all agree, you know, that alternatives have proof to save, you know, uh, drawdowns and to decrease the volatility in maybe the most volatile market that we have seen in the last 20 years. So what have been able to do alternatives from your point of view, Steve, to show this greater ability to adapt compared to traditional fund managers? Well, I, I think the best way to answer that is to unpack what, and, and I totally take the point that Chris and, and Richard are making there, which is that it's, it's hard to generalize what alternatives really is, but if 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 I if I do that and generalize, but you are um, a multi-strategy expert, so you have a very good view. I mean, uh, uh, what has course. worked? Okay, no, of course, so. of course. And the the, the if, if I if I unpack what's under the hood of, of alternatives, it's essentially we're looking to access an alternative um, market beta. There are um, returns from active decisions, and there's illiquidity um, premium, which is obviously very prevalent. Where I spend my time, and 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 those drive those divert those those drivers can be very diversifying versus traditional market risk. And importantly, strong alternative betas and strong and consistent active returns from active management decisions can be extremely consistent, um, much more consistent than than the way that the general market behaves. And so, in the long term, alternatives offer um, you know that performance efficiency. But in the shorter term, I think that's where the that's that's where the 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 anchor can come from. It's it's strong active decisions, and and like I said, where it's relevant in private markets, it's from illiquidity premium. So essentially, that's what investors are trying to do when they access alternatives: is make sure that they diversify away from market risk. Because when the market risk lets you down, you have other you have other tools in your toolkit. The risk is that investors allocate to alternatives. And don't un and they underappreciate that the way that they've done it might introduce um, 
essentially repackage the market risk. And that and that that's that's ultimately where investors can be can be can be let down and disappointed. But a well constructed, diversified portfolio that focuses on active management decisions and and potentially illiquidity premium can be can be very robust in all conditions. So active uh, decisions and flexibility, I guess, is what makes the difference to uh, uh, most of the alternative strategies and this what we have seen, you know, happening in a positive way during last year. If we move to the current environment and I will also ask uh, Steve, you know, to take this one because I'm starting from a broader view and I think that his company and his expertise in the company represent this broader view. Uh, you mentioned liquidity premium, okay? Uh, liquidity, it's across the board one of the big topics. I mean, there is a, central banks are just basically providing a, a free liquidity to everyone. And we are seeing a lot of investment decisions which are driven by liquidity and less by valuation. Okay. So, from your perspective, uh, from liquid usage to a uh, illiquid uh, private debt and private equity, what is the liquidity premium greatest in the current market? Yeah, it's 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 really interesting. It's unique right now in that um, you know our research tells us that the illiquidity premium is is cyclical. So there, there are periods where um, it can be lower, and and so investors should you know should be conscious of that. It tends to compress in the late cycle. It tends to expand in in the the post correction periods, um, and we can we can see that when we compare private data to to public market returns over the cycle. Typically, at this point in the cycle, we start to see deeper discounts. There, there are pockets of that in areas like you know, hospitality, real, real estate. Um, we see distressed opportunities in areas like leisure, for example, um, investors taking stakes in existing funds, so secondary investing, all of which are the classic ways of accessing greater illiquidity premium. However, because we've got this huge amount of fiscal support and monetary support, it's meant that the bottom has been a lot shallower. Um, but it's allowed a lot of um, a lot of growth, a uh, growth opportunity across assets and businesses. And so where we've seen the illiquidity premium manifest itself this time, which is a little bit different, is around lending solutions. That's where we saw it appear first. And we think it still exists. Conventional lending solutions, I think it's a well formed market and it's and, and, and the market can absorb that. But where there's where there's complexity and, and an unorthodox nature to um, to the situation, lending strategies and solutions that offer can offer a, a stronger risk adjusted return than what we saw 18 months ago. So strategies that embrace complexity around, you know, the assets or the customers or the um, the capital structure or even the investor base, if you're thinking about a secondary fund opportunity, they can take advantage of essentially that enhanced need for for capital, um, whether it's to fund growth or to or to reposition a business. So that's some that's where we've seen quite an obvious um, area of high illiquidity premium, which is a bit different to to previous cycles. And I'd say that this is this yeah. is probably where. Sorry, Boha, go on. No, please, please. I was, I was going to say this is probably where our view is probably a little bit different from Steve's in the sense that we prize liquidity above almost all else in, in terms of the flexibility that that offers us. And in terms of looking around the world right now, absolutely every asset class is expensive. If it's the S&P 500 trading on 31 times trend PE or the $12 trillion of negative yielding debt around the world, everything is expensive. Now, that in itself isn't a reason to get really panicky, I think, anytime soon. Actually, we've got a lot of support from central banks and growth is bouncing back and the vaccine data works. So I don't think that's a reason for, for, to have a lot of concern. But what I would say is it does leave us open or susceptible to shocks, market shocks, uh, when, when valuations are at, at these levels. Is it a Chinese hard landing? Is it inflation taking off far more aggressively than, than people suspect? Who knows? But for me, um, the, the liquidity offered in, in liquid large cap equities is something that we, we think at this point of the cycle is actually uh, vitally important. And this is, sorry, uh, Chris, uh, I guess you were going to basically touch the point that I'm going to uh, highlight now uh, in relation to this, which is all this liquidity, traditionally uh, uh, alternative uh, uh, fund managers take a lot of care of the management of the flows into their funds basically as a way to preserve you know the good performance that typically you know is a characteristics of this so how do you manage you invest in equities which is a very liquid part of the market 
how you need to take care of all the flows that we are seeing into equities and make this compatible with the taking care of the performance that you've been doing, uh, that is uh, basically a, 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 a core part of your business. Sure, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal Steve's framework, um, meaning that I'm going to disaggregate the flows in across um, the broad market exposure versus the active decisions. Um, and, and the broad market exposure, you know, as, as we get inflows into equities, um, those are well managed. Uh, they're well manageable to, to handle just sort of the broad continuous inflow into the space. Um, you know, to Richard's point, I would say is that what that winds up doing is it, it reduces your future expected returns to have all that liquidity flow in, um, which in, in some case for a panel like this means the importance of alternatives goes up because if you need to hit a return target, you're not going to get it just from, you know, stock bond exposure. Um, so the the broad liquidity of managing the inflows into equities in general, you know, if you were managing a, a passive index, that, that's well manageable, right? That the markets are liquid enough. Where it becomes a challenge is, is how do you manage the active decision making, right? Where um, you're seeking out uh, a little bit of, of added value from certain names or certain sectors of the, the, the marketplace um, where you might be more concentrated. And so for us, a big piece of that is building strategies that are, are much more diversified. Um, and so we're trying to capture kind of underlying fundamental causes of risk and return as opposed to idiosyncratic, like market specific, company specific events. Um, in some ways we try to avoid that stuff. And that's where, from our perspective, a lot, a lot of different people can make money in, in a lot of different ways. But from our perspective, we try to avoid those individual name, individual situation events, which, which can you know leave you off sides a little bit if, if things go against you. And, and it's about instead build these diversified portfolios that you can ease into and out of over time. And it, it becomes the, the liquidity shocks, the liquidity events, at least in the short term, become much less of an influence than if you are concentrated in a particular opportunity, a particular name. How are your, I mean, uh, if we take this to practice, so uh, can you tell us how your exposure and liquidity levels compare to uh, other uh, recent periods or your historical uh, uh, track record? Sure. So, so we target, you know, when we think about how much risk we want in the market, we, we think about it in risk space, right, rather than in dollar space, because obviously it's, it's you know, a very different beast 2020 you know, March of 2020 is a very different beast than March of 2006, right? It, it's um, the the market volatility is just a, a dramatically different event. And so for us, we're trying to manage the overall risk, risk levels, the overall volatility levels, um, and, and essentially the amount of exposure we have, the net exposure, the gross exposure we have, falls out of that within range, depending how, how volatile the world is. Um, and that's where... You know, we I would I would line up a little bit more in Richard's camp on on the importance of liquidity in the sense that when markets become more volatile, um, a liquid portfolio that can be you know dialed up or dialed down to maintain certain risk levels, um, we think at least can can navigate some of those stormy seas a little bit better um, than than a situation where um, you, you may not be able to adjust the portfolio in a in a market crisis. The uh, let's move to one uh, uh, question of today's in investing uh, uh, environment, which I guess is also getting a lot of attention. So for the first time in many years, and I'm sorry, you know, uh, to be a, a statement, but you know, coming from Europe, uh, definitely the the uh, the surprise today is that we don't have in inflation. I know that for the audience, you know, we could learn a lot about how to manage inflation, but that's what is happening with US dollars and your investments these days. So uh, there is a new uh, new neighbor here, which is inflation. Uh, how are you positioning or how you see your funds first? Which strategies can get a better exposure to a hedge for inflation? And which is the positioning that these strategies, these funds are taking today, if you consider that this is a case for, uh, for uh, 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 taking some attention? Steve? Yeah, great, great question. And, and, you know, there's been there's been a high degree of complacency um, on this topic, naturally, because we've been in a low inflation environment for for decades and, and whole careers. Um, and so 
Um, and, and now we're faced with different different drivers. Right? We have we have mechanical drivers, we have the recovery and mobility based um, services, we have recovery in, in energy prices, of course. Um, we have fundamental drivers, we have demand drivers, you know, higher savings rates, for example, we have um, lower goods inventory on the supply side. And then we have structural drivers like the change in the way the Fed, um, you know, the, the, the average tar uh, targeting approach that, that, that will affect things going forward. And so, you know, like many things, we try to stay away from the asset class names and think about the dimensions that matter. And with this topic, what really matters is three dimensions. One is the sensitivity um, to inflation. And that's really what gets a lot of attention. That's what investors are really thinking about most of the time is what is my sensitivity to inflation? And last year showed, and, and this year as well as the data comes through, it shows that the drivers of inflation have been very varied. You know, investors have come from a place where they think asset classes like real estate offer a very good inflation linkage and, and, and they do, but essentially it's only really one representation of the whole, of the, of, it's one component of the whole inflation basket. Um, whilst conventional forces are at play, you know, things like mobility related price changes um, are causing these really unusual pockets of inflation, like the, the price of a used car, for example. And so investors are increasingly recognizing the benefit of having a diversified set of assets that can target the different components of the overall inflation basket, which is not just real estate and you know, shelter in that case from, from an inflation perspective. So having things like commodities, transportation, um, even healthcare, for example, um, can make a big difference. The other dimension that is, that is very important and gets less attention is reliability. So if you combine those different asset classes together correctly in a diversified real asset type portfolio, then you can essentially create a more stable sensitivity over time. I think that's what gets less attention and can lead to disappointment for investors when essentially, you know, asset classes such as equity, they can have very good sensitivity to inflation, but, but it can be unstable relative to some of the alternatives that we can find. And so um, I think com combining the sensitivity and inflation and, and reliability is very important. And then finally, we always have to have an eye on efficiency. That's the third one is efficiency. So for example, I could combine commodities and shipping and start to satisfy the first ones, but I need to balance that with, with, um, with you know, the, the stabilizers of, for example, real estate or infrastructure or natural resources in order to both hit the sensitivity and the reliability, but also to get a, a, an efficient real uh, risk adjusted return as well. So I think alternatives can offer solutions in that space um, when we think about those dimensions together. Do you also share these views, Richard? Yeah, I mean, I think the inflation debate is probably the critical question for, for you and your investors over the course of the next five years. If you look at the uh, traditional bond and equity portfolio, you've had a fantastic time the last five or 10 years. Correlation has remained negative between the two and both are, have been in absolutely stonking, stonking bull markets. And if we see inflation take off, then all of a sudden, that negative correlation doesn't quite exist anymore, and you and you see, you know, both your bond and your equity holdings falling falling quite dramatically. So, can alternatives fill that void? You know, that's that's the big question, I think. And on the inflation debate itself, you know, I'm reminded of the Nazim Talib quote around the the ketchup bottle, whereby inflation's a bit like the ketchup inside, where you're tap tap tapping on on the back and and nothing comes out, and then all of a sudden you know, you've got an awful lot of inflation in the system again. And, you know, how, how are we going going to deal with that? So is it transitory? Is it structural? Again, I think the debate is going to rage on for quite some time. And no one will be able to say uh, with any conviction, I think, for, for a good sort of six to 12 months from here. But what I would say is there are signs of more sticky inflation in this cycle, be it wages in the US and the UK, but also looking at uh, the way the, the rental market has changed quite dramatically over the course of the last six months or so. So for me, across our portfolios, it's about taking that balance and, and uh, including some of those infl inflation hedges within the portfolio. So, for example, two of our biggest net exposures in, in the funds right now are actually uh, net long positions to financials. And dare I say, it, European financials, you know, one of the scariest, most unloved areas of the last cycle, yeah. you know, trading on 0.5 book value and a, a huge optionality around uh, the, these inflationary forces remaining stronger for, for a little bit longer. 
And then, of course, on the short side as well, there's been a load of growth names we've been desperate to short. But every time they've fallen foul on earnings, then, you know, they, nobody's really cared too much because of that, that bucket of stocks that they've been included in. And you haven't really been rewarded for that. I think if we do move into this inflationary environment, all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the short exposure you can, you can gain in long short portfolios, all of a sudden the, the alpha opportunities are increased quite dramatically. So I think it's, it's critical. And I think actually in, in a long short portfolio, you've got the tools there to, to, to do it. Um, I would say that there's maybe maybe been a few funds that have benefited quite dramatically from this growth value divide over the last 10 years. And it's how they, they manage this possible change in market leadership will, will define a lot of careers and define a lot of absolute returns over the last over the next next market cycle. Yeah, if I had a, um, a bone to pick with Richard and this may uh, this may extend to the fact that I have a few more wrinkles than he does. But he had said it was a, a good five to 10 years for stocks and bonds. I would argue it's been a good 40 years for stocks and bonds based on that declining uh, interest rate, at least here in, in, in the US. And so you do run that risk of, of a lot of the industry never having managed portfolios through rising rising uh, inflationary environments, at least here in, in, you know, uh, in, in the US. Um, and so how the, the challenge, though, is inflation is just as hard to predict as anything else. And so how do you build a portfolio, um, you know, particularly at at the level of, you know, setting up various different client portfolios for for the medium to long run? And that's where I think, you know, again, I'm, I'm going to go back to I, I like Steve's setup of sort of the asset class exposure and the active decisions. Um, you have you have levers on both sides to help protect against inflation, even if you don't know which way inflation is going to go. Right, because everybody everybody talks about it as if as if higher inflation is a done deal. Um, it's not a done deal, right? It, it's it's it, it's it's a risk. Um, and so, um, you know, on the liquid side for us, commodities wind up being a good way of of getting allocation to um, a diversifying asset class. Because when you know when inflation goes up, a sixty forty stock bond portfolio is not going to do well. Right. Both of those things do poorly in, in rising inflation environments. And so how do you diversify that? And then on the active decision, this is a place where where, you know, some exposure to macro strategies can be can be particularly helpful, um, you know, whether they are our fundamental trend following or even price trend following. You have the ability to, um, uh, you know, position and take advantage of those because because inflation doesn't happen in steps. Right. You don't get. You don't get a month of zero inflation and then a month of 30 percent inflation and then months of two percent inflation, and then a month of 30. Right. It, it tends to build over time. And so you can you can capture some of that through um, through some of these active strategies that position on the underlying fundamental economic trends and the subsequent price trends that result. Great. So what I guess is that uh, and that's just the uh, uh, question for Steve. I mean, uh, it is difficult to find value in fixed income these days. Uh, do you agree with this? value in fixed income yeah yeah i, th I think I, th I think the challenge with fixed income today is 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 what it serves as a, a it, its role for for an investor and and it's 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 served as an important um stabilizer alongside growth assets whether it's equities um or or you know, private equity or in my case for example i think the the forward-looking uh, prospects for that are are particularly challenged given where debt levels are, given where interest rates are, um, and so the question is is how do you construct a portfolio that can that can essentially replace some of that stability that you might not otherwise receive from that from that part of your portfolio going forward? And and ultimately, if I go back to my point before, if you can if you can accurate if you can if you can accurately identify alternative betas, good active returns. And potentially illiquidity premium that are supplementing your 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 market risk that can be a way of delivering consistency not only the point was made earlier not only to get to your target return which might not be possible in traditional assets but also replace some of that that stability that otherwise was there in the fixed income portfolio okay thank you from my uh, uh, activity in all funds uh, and all the fun launches that i see during the year mostly in the traditional f space it's been months that it's impossible to see a fund launch without the ESG label, okay? Sustainability. Uh, is this is ESG also reaching the alternatives world? Uh, can alternatives and 
again, being very generic, but you can definitely uh, uh, narrow the uh, alternatives definition towards the uh, strategy of your expertise. Can alternatives be sustainable? How is the alternative, the hedge fund industry evolving to be ESG? If this is a demand that also investors, you know, are showing for your company. Richard? Uh, thanks. And the answer is absolutely they can be sustainable. And, you know, integrating ESG analysis into our portfolios has been something that we've done for many years in the sense that we see a very clear link between strong or, or improving ESG credentials and the cost of equity applied to a, to a share price or, or a company. So over time, what we'd expect in our portfolios is stronger ESG performers on the long side and, and weaker ESG performers on, on the short side. But I think it's very important not to be too prescriptive with this, especially at this point in time where a lot of the data and the reliability around data is still um, something that's, that's, that's forming. So I think it just needs to be one part of your fundamental analysis, not something that's all, all encompassing. And the sort of couple of examples that spring to mind on this is if actually you look at the European utility sector so far on a year to date basis, they are at the forefront of the green energy transition through solar and wind, but they've increasingly reached sort of darling status within the market. And some of the valuations ran ahead of, ran ahead of themselves quite aggressively through the back end of last year. And this is at the same time where a lot of the oil majors are coming in and being much, much more competitive when they're, when they're bidding for contracts, just desperately trying to reshape their business away from what's seen as, as dirty oil. So from a fundamental basis, it's, it is crucially important. Um, you've, just got to, you've just got to apply it in the right ways within your portfolios, we believe. Yeah, so it is a natural way to invest because definitely ESG companies generate better returns because they have a reduced cost of capital. I think it's a very, you know, a, a self-explanatory, you know, way to uh, uh, define the benefits of uh, ESG. Do you agree with this, Chris? Do you incorporate ESG criteria in your portfolios? So so we do. We have both um, ESG-related signals across our entire alpha book, right? There, there are certain aspects of ESG that, that just help identify companies that will make better risk-adjusted returns over the long run. Those, those tend to be focused in the G category related to, to more um, corporate governance. But whenever we find an alpha signal, whether it's ESG or not, we're going to incorporate it into our alpha models. Um, it's then on top of that, we can do additional ESG constraints for client considerations. In there, there is a little bit of a trade-off in terms of we think of, we think of this as an ESG efficient frontier of what are the trade-offs you could make on the expected return to risk of the portfolio relative to how much of an ESG impact you want. And there are, there are, are legitimate, um, there are legitimate trade-offs there. What I will say is that for alternatives, you know, if you think you can apply ESG in a long only equity framework, going long short only expands the ability of that you can have to, to impact that. It, it provides an additional layer of flexibility. Um, you know, think if, if you're in a long only context and you have a, you know, a particularly bad citizen, the best you could do is not hold that company. Whereas in a long short context, you can actually take a short position uh, on that company. And so it just creates some more flexibility in the portfolio to both add value, right, in a pure alpha standpoint, you know, that that shorting allows more alpha, but also in the implementation of ESG, it, it does the same. No, definitely. You can be ESG and anti-ESG, you know, in the short part of their portfolio, which is uh, which is great. Uh, how other strategies apart from equity, Steve, can reach ESG standards, you know, when investing? Yeah. And... I want to start by just addressing sort of the elephant in the room, I guess, which is which is why alternatives, particularly private markets, are behind, which I think there are a few things at play. One is that I think investors are sequencing their focus when it comes to um, leaning on the industry to uh, and applying pressure on the industry to, to, to make the right changes when it comes to ESG. And, um, you know, that started with larger traditional exposures. And it's now, you know, there's more attention now turning to alternatives, which, which, which will ultimately drive that, that attention. Um, I think some strategies by their nature are harder to, to uh, achieve the ESG application. 
maybe you know some of the high frequency hedge fund trading for example is is you know it, it has some complexity to it and then i also think there's inconsistency of, around what investors really want um you know i speak to different investors around um you know richard mentioned oil and gas for example so is 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 oil and gas excluded from an esg portfolio or would a company that is cleaning up the oil and gas industry for example a company that focuses on um, capturing otherwise flared gas is that is that ESG positive or is it is is it excluded and so I think those things are are the things that those are the open items that need to be sold for and I, I think they are I think in private markets we have we essentially have a head start in that even if you put ESG aside um, we've always had a focus on the caliber um, the alignment and the integrity of the underlying management teams it's always been a really critical qualitative component of private investing. We've always tried to achieve an unencumbered connectivity between ownership and management, which again can drive positive impact if it's if it's applied appropriately. And so as 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 Chris and Richard alluded to, we can move much further than uh, beyond the sort of do no harm type investing. If I think about you know the way you drive value, it, it comes from your earnings growth where you know, in many of the markets I see in private markets, we have we have huge ESG opportunities around the energy transition. Um, you know, a, a, something very familiar to me at the moment is a water opportunity, which is essentially improving the the quality, um, the customer service, um, and the and the the wastage essentially of of very underinvested and fragmented water markets. Um, we've you know we've looked at farmland opportunities where the quality of the soil and the water efficiency of those businesses can really can really drive the earnings growth in drought environments. And so I think there are plenty of opportunities where ESG and financial returns intersect. I think at the moment, as the point that was made earlier, I think is absolutely right. I think a company that's on the wrong side of ESG um, will be penalized by the market. And so I think those two things are completely intertwined now, which is, which is, a, which is a good thing. Great, thanks, Steve. Let's move to a different topic, okay? And maybe that's not the one that uh, typically comes in the uh, 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 in these market discussions, but I cannot forget, you know, from my perspective in, in all funds, you know, as uh, one of the largest fund distributors in the world, it's been the, uh, uh, in the last two months, we just uh, don't stop, you know, uh, uh, getting requests from investors, mainly coming from the private banking space, if we can provide access to cryptocurrency or crypto investing, okay? And we see a number of fund managers uh, launching uh, crypto funds. There are ETFs in the market that replicate the movement of mainly cryptocurrencies, but we are now seeing some Luxembourgese-based uh, uh, fund managers uh, 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 launching new funds. Uh, so the question is very open because I guess this is quite new. Uh, can we consider cryptocurrencies an alternative asset class? And could we see any of your companies, your funds, getting into cryptocurrencies in the near term, or are you thinking to launch some speciality uh, crypto investing funds? So uh, can we start with uh, Chris? Sure, so um, we do not have uh, crypto funds at this time, and we have no sort of short term uh, expectations of launching crypto at AQR. Um, that shouldn't be interpreted as um, a, a strong statement against crypto, so much as it's, it's not yet a financial instrument that really fits our particular approach. So for us, you know, we we build our our models based on underlying economic relationships that's backed with a, a large amount of empirical data based on those fundamental relationships. And so, you know, crypto, if you think of it as a cryptocurrency, um, the the things that establish our currency models, right, where we trade currency versus currency. Um, crypto is not really in a position to be modeled against those. Um, if you think about underlying fundamental, um, you know, the fundamental momentum of underlying uh, companies and the, the yield curve and valuations based on underlying economic, um, you know, the underlying economic pricing of, a, of an economy relative to its currency across multiple ads. So crypto doesn't really fit in to those models. Um, you know, it is certainly possible that someone can build a timing model or or even a cross-sectional model across multiple um, multiple cryptocurrencies. It doesn't really fit our approach, um, and, and it's not something I think we feel comfortable yet 
including in a portfolio of long risk premia, right, where you're, you're collecting, you know, long equities plus long fixed income plus long credit, long commodities in a, in a diversified asset class there. Um, could it evolve to that? P perhaps. Um, we, we don't really have a house view on that. But the, the magnitude of the data and the connection to the underlying economics at this point just doesn't fit our approach particularly well. I would, um, I come at it from a different place, um, but essentially arrive at the same conclusion as Chris in that, you know, it's, it, it warrants a lot of time and effort and, and, and thought, and, and we are continuously monitoring the space. I think um, you were spending a lot of time trying to understand the use cases and the value of those, um, which, you know, in the interest of time, uh, you know, I don't think we should go into now, but I think ultimately the, the, the biggest, the, the most important drive for us is, is the ability to store value and and achieve you know important features like inflation hedging which are essentially what we use the alternatives for right the, the closest substitutes such as such as gold um and like gold and other commodities it's essentially a supply and demand um equation um rather than the cash flow equation like you would expect in, in equity and bonds and so you know the supply side is fairly well understood if you think about the way currencies are are con are, are limited um quantitatively, although new currencies can obviously cause some disruption. The, the issue for us is on the demand side. The demand is highly unstable. Um, and, you know, the exact role of, of currencies, of cryptocurrencies remains unclear and unproven. And that, and that essentially, I think, is what's driving that, that instability of demand. Now, so while gold as, a, as, a, as an alternative has, you know, very clear relationships with yields, currency, um, currencies inflation as well, which essentially is what I think Chris is alluding to when he thinks about the historical relationships. Cryptocurrency just doesn't offer us that that predictability. So from an asset allocation perspective, for us, um, we need to see more predictability around around what the what the demand will cause in order to to understand what it adds to the portfolio. So for us, it's too early to introduce um, to the portfolios, but we're playing we're we're obviously paying co close attention to. It. Yeah, and I would second the guy's comments around risk. You know, nobody's got any idea what the volatility of Bitcoin's going to be over the course of the next six months. So if you're looking to build a risk-adjusted portfolio. Would... <laughs> so, sorry, Boha? I would say the volatility will be quite high. I mean, you wake up in the morning, you see plus 10, you go for lunch and it's minus 10, you know, so definitely volatility is warranted. Maybe that's the way to make money, you know, with volatility. Yeah, but is it fifty percent or hundred percent volatility yeah. when you try when you've got a return target? You know, you've got to try and figure those out. I must admit. The other the other two things I would say would add is um, look, blockchain. There is clearly um, value in the blockchain technology, but there's clearly a reluctance by regulators to uh, allow it in certain forms that that facilitate money laundering as they are at the moment. So, who's the winner in blockchain? Which crypto is it? I mean, I think I honestly believe that that's anyone's guess. But for me, and when I re relate it back to our portfolios, how am I trying to make money out of crypto at the moment? Actually, if you look at a, a crypto trading platform, the US Coinbase has actually been a very nice short position for us. And the reason we look at that is we say, OK, at the moment, they're earning a 300, 350 basis point spread on all the transactions that are going on there. So those margins aren't something that's met by any other exchange in the world. So either it, it is, continues to be broadly adopted and you see margins fall by 99% or you actually see it, it fail and crypto not take off as, as many appear. Either way, I think it's a very interesting short case um, given that scenario where, where we are at the moment. So um, I think it's going to present a lot of opportunities. But like I say, because of the risk return profile of our funds, it's not something we're considering yet. There is uh, one member of the audience uh, Clearly, uh, stating that uh, stating that this is the uh, best performing asset class year today. So definitely, I guess that crypto will be in the agenda of many of your discussions and uh, Q and A over the following months. Let's move quickly to the final session before we give a uh, pass to the audience. Uh, and I'm going to make you one question, and I would ask you to uh, uh, respond in one minute. Okay? And it's very simple, at least to make the question uh, for the next 12 months. Where would you put your money being very specific in which sub asset class within alternatives region uh, uh, strategy? I mean, uh, uh, whatever you want, but let's be very uh, uh, specific and let's do it please in one minute. Uh, Chris. 
Sure. So uh, I'm going to restrict my answer to be within global equities in a market neutral context, just because that's that's my area of expertise. Um, and it's within industry value. So it's it's buying the cheap securities relative to their expensive economic peers. Um, it's something that's dislocated globally. It's especially dislocated within emerging market equities. Um, and so that's really a subset of, of long short market neutral equity is, is value oriented and in particular, the more emerging market side of, of global equities. Thank you. Steve? Uh, renewable energy, uh, I think it's got a lot. It's, it, there have been distractions. Um, you know, company boards, politicians, regulators have got big things to deal with at the moment. Um, but the, the medium term case, I think, is is very much intact. Um, the technology improves, the level of, levelized cost of energy falls. Um, we now have corporate offtakes providing a huge amount of demand that we didn't have before. Government policies heading in the right direction. And over the last year or so, it was it. You know, a lot of renewables have the first right of dispatch. So as power prices fall, they 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 show their value, um, and they're essentially a zero cost marginal cost producer. So I think I think that it, it warrants a lot of attention. I think installing further capacity is clearly an investment opportunity, but I would encourage investors to think about what I think of as the renewable enabling opportunities. So thinking about storage. The transmission grid, which essentially has been built around consolidation, and now we're dispersing the power generation again. Um, peaking facilities to deal with the intermittency of solar and wind, for example. So, I, I believe that no, the, the the solar park or the, the the wind farm are no longer the weakest link. The weakest link is the enabling infrastructure that's required around renewable energy, and there there will be investment opportunities there. And I would say global long short equities. I think those managers effectively have the toolkit to cope with the, the changes we're seeing in markets and the potential change in leadership that, that we're seeing within markets. But what I'd also add is that it might not be about buying the best performing global long short manager of the last five years. I think there's a lot of managers that have had a great time going long growth short value. I'm not sure if the trade will be that simple going forward. So look at those where you've actually got evidence of, of stock alpha not just style alpha um, for, from your managers great thanks a lot for your uh, this uh, clear uh, uh, view of what the next 12 months can be i guess it's time now to uh, to ask the audience we've been receiving some questions live but i there might be a, a more questions so uh, carolina if you want to uh, 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 ask the audience, and in the meanwhile, be, as we receive the questions, I will uh, uh, basically uh, uh, also keep on uh, asking you things. Okay, so uh, we also touch the uh, uh, the different shifts within asset classes and, and markets that we have seen. So, uh, is it a theme for you the uh, moving a uh, growth uh, to value? Is it a, a specific theme within a and definitely because we are talking about equity and we have a very uh, 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 world-class uh, two uh, equity uh, specialists here, uh, I guess we can get a very good question because it's either, as we said, not just playing with I am long in growth uh, or long in value, but you can play both sides. Is this something, uh, Chris, that is a, a theme in your portfolios? It, it, it is. We have, um, you know, we have a material allocation over the long run and actually a little bit of a larger allocation than normal now to the to the concept of value uh, of buying cheap companies, you know, companies whose prices are inexpensive relative to their underlying fundamentals when compared to their economic peers. So other companies in a similar industry, as opposed to a you know, utilities versus tech kind of bad. We don't think value, um, the, the way we approach it is, is is telling there. What I would say though, is that that type of value is not completely opposite to growth in that you can incorporate an eye on valuations while also incorporating an eye on, you know, in, in factor terminology, I would call it fundamental momentum, right? Those companies that are improving their conditions, their earnings are improving, their expectations of growth are increasing, their margins are increasing. Um, and so it's not quite as simple as, you know, the opposite of value is a company that that grows a lot um, and, and that looking across the board and saying, OK, you know, the, the value opportunity now is extremely dislocated. 
it, it's extremely dislocated. And so when that has occurred in the past, that has been indicative of a very good period for, for industry neutral value going forward. Um, and so certainly you, you, you should take advantage of that. Or, you know, I think a, a, our process is designed to take advantage of that. Um, but I also think it's the case where um, you don't just ignore growth expectations or the quality of a balance sheet or, or what other uh, other investors are doing. It's always value in the context, or almost always value in the context of, of everything else. Thank you. We have one question from the audience. Uh, whoever wants to take it, please go ahead. So uh, I think it's in relation with the ESG uh, thematic that we touched before. Can you comment anything on carbon credits as an alternative commodity? I can't comment too much around the pricing of carbon credits, but what I can say is pretty much every CEO and CFO that I meet are, are desperate to try and buy some and, and hit their carbon neutrality targets that, that bit sooner and seeing their ESG, ESG credentials rise as a result. So I, I don't see the, the supply side of things so much there, but I can see the demand side is hot and only, only becoming higher. So uh, now I think that's going to be a, a, an underpinned area of the market. On my side, on the, on the private side, it's leading to a, a lot of optimism around around earnings, um, different earnings sources, but quite a lot of uncertainty at the moment. As I think about um, you know, some of the agricultural investments that we have or some of the um, uh, you know, infrastructure, renewable energy investments we have, essentially, um, you know, the producers of, of these assets um, are starting to un try to understand how they can um, model that into forward-looking earnings expectations but it's it's really early stage i'd say it's i'd say it's being discounted quite heavily from that perspective just because of the uncertainty but a lot of optimism as to how you know, that side of the the industry can can benefit from that transfer thank you uh, i have another question which is regarding also the the uh, uh you know, always you know the etf and the traditional fund industry they seem to be a uh, uh, faster, you know, launching uh, uh, more specific funds that get the uh, traction of the uh, investors. So we see a, a big trend and trend, including the uh, main flows this year, which are going into equity, but they are going into a specialty equity sector funds. So uh, thematic funds, uh, we are seeing a consumer trend funds. We are seeing electric mobility funds. We are seeing, of course, biotech with all these vaccine, you know, uh, investing. Uh, uh, we see, uh, as I said before, on the traditional and ETF wall, uh, a lot of interest, fund launches, and flows into these funds. Is this something that uh, can happen in the uh, alternatives or by the nature of the flexibility of the alternative investments, those so specific sector funds, though they exist, will be always, you know, a, a very small part of the market? Uh, uh, Chris, do you have a view here? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly possible for those funds to establish a, a foothold. Um, you know, we're a systematic manager and so we like highly diversified portfolios. So sector specific opportunities really don't appeal quite as much to us because it's it's a less broad universe to to apply our, our strategies to. Um, but, you know, I've certainly seen some, you know, successful concentrated long short managers out there who, who really stick in a particular area um, certainly can can add value. It's not how we do things, but it's it's nothing says that that a manager can't add value, knowing that space very well, being concentrated and in, in staying in that in in that in their lane. In, in private markets, I would I would say um, it's interesting because it specialization has existed for a long time. It's, it's not where the bulk of capital goes, but there are specialized managers um, with very long uh, track records and, and success. And actually, our research suggests that there's a strong positive relationship between alpha generation and an element of specialization, whether it's country specialization or sector or, or, or both. Um, there's, a, there's an increased chance, we believe, in, in high and, and persistent um, active return generation. Now, that's not always feasible commercially. If you think about it, some of the deal flow can be very uneven. So looking for a manager to focus on, um, you know, private airports, for example, in, in infrastructure is, is not is not particularly realistic. Um, but other sectors are quite conducive for specialization. So if you think about you know, telecoms or renewables, as my previous example, 
there are there's a lot of um, specialized um, strategy opportunities in those areas. So we'd encourage investors to to consider those, but keeping in mind the complexity that it can introduce into your portfolio by by doing that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say it's at, at odds with what we're looking to achieve for our clients. In truth, we spend so much of our day trying to reduce the factor risk within the portfolio, really concentrate down to the stock specific rather than oil or currency or any other factor risk that you, you have there. And to narrow your universe to one particular industry or, or subsector, it just it goes against what we're looking to achieve. So I can understand clients looking to, to, to gain those exposures, but it's it's not for us and what we're looking to do in our portfolios. OK, great. So we are moving now to the final question. Uh, and let me touch uh, this uh, very important point these days. Uh, so uh, who do you think will be the uh, uh, winner for the Euro Cup and the, uh, and the Copa America? OK, and let me start, take this one first and be very predictable. OK, so my bet is uh, Spain and Brazil. OK, so uh, Steve. I will, of course, say Brazil in an, un in an uneducated way. In, in Europe, um, I would say, unfortunately, Belgium. I would say uh, Brazil have probably got a better chance against Chile than we do against Germany in a couple of hours. But um, I'm going to say, yeah, of course, I'm going to say Brazil and I'm going to say uh, England. It's coming home. <laughs> and, and so you end with a guy who knows football to be played with helmet and shoulder pads. So. Uh, <laughs> Perhaps I'm not the best one. So given the audience, I'm not going to vote against Brazil. And uh, 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 Rich has said, tough time with Germany. I'll go with Germany. What the heck? Oh, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Great. we could be friends. <laughs> Someone's got to so throw a bomb ahead. of some kind on a panel. <laughs> OK, great. I think that's the. Uh, it's been a great fun, at least for me, and very quick. Uh, I hope also for the audience. And let me now pass you to uh, Laura again for the uh, uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, Richard, Steve, and Bodham. Obrigado a todos que participaram desse painel. Aproveito para mencionar que, em parceria com a AQR, nós distribuímos no Brasil o fundo, fundo Long Bias. Em parceria com a Genus Henderson, nós distribuímos o fundo Global Technology. E em parceria com Morgan Stanley, nós distribuímos o fundo Global Insight. Lembrando que amanhã teremos o terceiro dia da nossa conferência e o tema será o mundo de rendimento zero às 10 da manhã. Muito obrigada e até amanhã.